Kush in northern Sudan is one of the forgotten kingdoms of Africa and the ancient world. The kings of Kush reached the zenith of their power in the 8th century BC when they conquered their neighbor Egypt and their influence extended as far as the modern day Middle East. Sudan's capital, Khartoum, where the Blue and White Niles meet. The waters of the two rivers merge to form the mighty River Nile that flows through northern Sudan into Egypt and ends its journey there, where it joins the Mediterranean Sea. The Blue Nile starts deep in the Ethiopian highlands, and the waters of the White Nile flow from Lake Victoria in East Africa, although it probably originates from deeper inside Central Africa. The River Nile has for centuries played silent witness to the great civilizations that existed close to its banks. Unexpected game of football in the town of Karima in northern Sudan. The youngsters laugh quite rightly at my lack of goalkeeping skills. Personally, I don't think I'm that bad for a woman of a certain age. As I try to bridge the generation gap, so too does the town of Karima. It reaches down through the generations to a time long gone by when it was known as Kerma. And it is here that we begin the story of the Kingdom of Kush. Early humans existed in Sudan for tens of thousands of years. By about 5000 BC, we know that people in northern Sudan lived from fishing, hunting and basic farming. And there's evidence that they raised cattle too. They lived in relatively small, independent and separate population groups. They had to be mobile so they could find good pasture for their livestock. The rich waters of the River Nile made the land fertile, which meant crops could grow easily, so farmers could settle down and develop communities. The climate began to dry out gradually, starting from about 5000 BC, across northern Africa, including what is today Sudan. This drove more people into the Nile Valley in search of hospitable land. It meant there were larger centers of population which became urbanized and a hierarchy of chiefs or princes developed. By around 2500 BC, Kerma had become the center for the people who came to be known as the Kushites. Their buildings include large structures called defufas, which stood up to 18 meters high. The ancient site of Kerma comprises two striking edifices, both built of sun-dried mud brick. They're known as the Western and Eastern defufa. Behind me is the Western defufa, which is believed to have been a temple. The eastern defufa is a funerary chapel surrounded by a cemetery of mound graves. Archaeologist and historian Dr. Abdul Rahman Ali is director of Sudan's National Museum in the capital Khartoum. The two defufas in Karma, uh, these are two monumental uh, mud brick monuments. They belong to the Kingdom of Kerma, which was known as the first uh, independent national kingdom in the Sudan, developed in 2500 BC. And the kings of Kerma, they ruled Kerma for almost a thousand years. And Kerma was known as the first uh, and big urban 
center in the sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, these two monuments, uh, they were used as temples used by the local community and the kings. And in this monument, we could uh, find the first indication of the utilization of the brick in the Nile Valley, that is in uh, Kerma. An important fact about Kerma is that Kerma, during that time, it acts as a national symbol and united all the tribes of the Sudan in one uh, agglomeration. We learn something about the inhabitants of Kerma from their death rituals, their customs, and what kind of objects they made and used. The traditional Kerma grave, like this one, is marked by a dome-shaped tumulus of earth, outlined by a ring of black stones sprinkled over with white pebbles. The body was placed on the south side of the burial chamber. There was also pottery in the grave. Dr. Shadia Taha is a Sudanese archaeologist teaching at Cambridge University in England. Pottery is always abundant in all archaeological sites because it doesn't decay and it survives in all environments and climates. Pottery found in Sudan gave us information about the Neolithic groups who lived in Sudan at that time, um, Bronze Age groups and uh, Iron Age groups. Uh, we know a lot of deal about the clay they use, the techniques they use, the styles, the decoration. Uh, it tells us about the complexity of the ceramics. It tells us about trade and exchange. And um, what we know now that pottery was found in Sudan at 8000 BCE. The National Museum in Khartoum has many exhibits from ancient Sudan. Between 1780 to 1580 BC, Kerma culture was vibrant. The people wore beautiful jewelry. They had bronze mirrors, stoneware, and delicate pottery. Some experts believe the ancient Sudanese were the first to develop the technique of enameling pottery. This period of ancient Sudan's history is linked to that of its neighbor to the north, Egypt. At about the same time in ancient Egypt, that is around 3000 BC, the first dynasties were establishing the rule of the pharaohs. What was the relationship like between these two close kingdoms? It was both hostile and complementary. And over the centuries, the balance of power would shift from one to the other. As Shadia Taha explains, in the writing of history, mostly by Western scholars, the importance of ancient Sudan in this relationship has been rather overlooked. Both countries influenced each other, but the Eurocentric group, they always thought of um, Kerma as um, younger than Egypt and always copying Egypt. But they didn't give um, Kerma the credit it deserves because Kerma was a very advanced state and its civilization predated Babylon, Rome, and Greece. So the exchange of ideas went both ways. It wasn't just a receiver of ideas from Egypt. When relations were bad, the pharaohs of Egypt would launch raids into Kerma, and the people of Kerma also raided the Egyptians. However, when their relationship was good, trade flourished between the two kingdoms. Donkeys were used as pack animals. Unlike camels, they need a lot of water. So that supports the theory that at this time, the climate in northern Sudan was more green and humid than it is today. As well as moving goods overland, they transported them along the Nile on boats that were later dismantled. The wood was reused in Egypt for building. But trade was hampered at certain times of the year when the Nile was impassable because of its cataracts. There are six cataracts in the river. The first of them is here at this very spot in Aswan in southern Egypt. The other five are in modern-day Sudan. And as you can see behind me, 
cataracts are rock formations in the river. And this meant that boats and ships would crash into them unless the waters of the Nile were high enough for them to avoid doing so. That meant that for a large part of the year, the waters of the River Nile were not navigable. So traders would have to use overland routes, and this was more arduous and took a longer time. Throughout history, the cataracts on the Nile gave the people of ancient Sudan a good natural defense from attackers coming by boat. Kerma laid the bedrock for the civilization of the Kushites, which was well known for its very powerful army. They were very fierce archers, and the Egyptians called them the land of the bow because of their skills in the bow. So they know their ability and their strength and their power. In 1650, the Kushites ransacked Egypt, but they just went back. Kush was a powerful state and the Egyptians feared Kush. So during this period of history, the Kushites succeeded in increasing their control of trans-African trade through the Sahara to the detriment of Egypt. For thousands of years, camel trains have made this journey from the south across the Sahara to Egypt. These camels are resting by the roadside and taking water in Dongola, in territory that would have been part of the kingdom of Kush. Kush was a vital crossroads for trade in the ancient world, linking the west and the east in the Red Sea, and then from the south to the north in the Mediterranean. The overland route through the hot terrain was difficult in the past and still is today. This man tells me they've ridden from Darfur in western Sudan and are on their way to Cairo. That's a distance of nearly 2,000 kilometers. I wish him well on his journey to Egypt and bid him goodbye. Trade across land and along the Nile was, of course, a critical source of wealth, and so the Egyptians wanted to regain control of this trade route to restore their fortunes. By 1550 BC, ancient Egypt was at the start of a new golden age, and powerful rulers like Queen Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III made it their mission to build up Egypt's trade again. Tutmosis III sent an army up the Nile and defeated the people at Kerma. Now Egypt could take full advantage and exploit the kingdom's resources. A new kingdom arose further south from Kerma in Napata, or Napta, as the Sudanese call it. My own opinion, they moved to Napta for economic, political, and religious reasons. Um, economic reasons because Napta was a meeting place for trade. The population was growing, as uh, they were already urban, they needed more resources. More resources were available in those to supply an increasing population. And um, religious reason, Jabal Barkal is a sacred mountain, which Egyptians and Kushites believe that Amun um, resides in Jabal Barkal. The god Amun-Ra. Uh, the god Amun-Ra. So it is sacred for the Egyptians and the, and the Kushites. The Kushites' new kingdom at Napata is near the modern-day town of Karima by a mountain known today as Jabal Barkal. Their move coincided with another decline in Egypt, which had become so engulfed in its own internal rivalries that it paid little attention to Kush. This meant the kingdom at Napata, which began in El Kuru, could develop undisturbed.
As the civilization of Napta evolved from Al Kuru, it starts as a small chiefdom and developed to a kingship, and later on developed to an empire. By the 8th century BC, the kings of Kush were growing ever richer and more powerful. At the Kushite capital of Napata, the mountain dominated the landscape much as it does today. In its shadow, life goes on in Al Kuru. Time, I think, to abandon the open desert in search of human inhabitants. I want to get a feel for the kind of settlements that existed in the ancient kingdom of Kush and how far some of the ancient customs and practices still exist in modern day Sudan. So I've been asking the ladies of the house to show me things which I know were used in the era of the Kushites and which I know were still used today. And this is what's known as a zeal. And this was used in ancient times to keep water cool. So I find it absolutely fascinating that I can find an old house like this that is just so evocative of that uh, period of Sudanese history. You can see the traditions of the Kushite kingdom still living on in the people who uh, inhabit this uh, area. People here eat the same grains and use similar earthenware storage urns. And the style of beds is one that has been in continuous use since ancient times. I remember beds like this from decades ago in the Sudan. But um, of course, people have since moved on and tend to use mattresses, which is why I suppose why this has just been used as a repository for dates. So the wooden bed have an important uh, significance to the Sudanese community through the whole period from Karma, from 2500 BC up to now, because it have a significance in the uh, daily life for wedding the bride and groom. They were, the ceremony started on a wooden bed, we call it a grape, and even for the circumstances of the boys, it was used. And finally, it was used to carry the deceased. If somebody dies, he will be carried to his uh, final destination by a bed. I've come across a wedding party in a settlement at the foot of Jabal Barkal. The men are gathered waiting for the ceremony to start. I reckon I can seize the chance to go and visit the women at the wedding breakfast to see some female customs that have endured throughout the centuries. The bridegroom very helpfully takes me across the road to meet the ladies. I'm just looking at this lady's hands with the henna and the beautiful gold. Two things that we had, of course, in the Kushite kingdom, the gold and then, of course, the henna. The women of Kush dipped their hands in henna, decorated it, and they also wore coal on their eyes, like this lady here. <laughs> and this is the holder that the coal is kept in today. And uh, the bridegroom's aunt, Samira, is going to show us how they would use it. <laughs> Amazing, she did it without any mirror. <laughs> Kushite women, like one famous princess who lived in the 8th century called Amenirdis, wore elaborate jewellery. She probably had fine gold rings, bracelets and colourful beaded necklaces like these in the National Museum, some made of ostrich eggshells.
Amanirdis would have worn her hair flat to the head with a top knot, her long nails stained with henna, and her eyes darkened with coal. So you can see the continuity of tradition is very much alive amongst the women at the wedding preparations. And you can also see it in the very masculine pursuit of wrestling, an activity which has stood the test of time. The Kushites were renowned wrestlers and were held in high esteem for their skill and fighting ability. Today in Sudan, especially in the Nuba Mountains in the southwest of the country, wrestling tournaments are held regularly. In days gone by, the Kushites would have engaged in such wrestling matches for sport. These local young men are clearly letting off a bit of steam as well as entertaining spectators. By the early 8th century BC, ancient Egypt's fighting capability was much diminished. The country had grown weak and it could no longer ward off invaders. Egypt came under the rule of princes from Libya who had their own traditions and religion and had no regard whatsoever for those of the Egyptians. This was a source of great dismay for the Kushites. Through centuries of interaction, the Kushites had a religion and culture similar to the ancient Egyptians. They spoke their own Kushitic language, though they used Egyptian hieroglyphics for writing. By 750 BC, the Kushites had had enough of the decadence of the Libyan princes and their allies in Egypt. At that time, Kush was ruled by a king called Kashta, and he believed it was his duty to save the Egyptians from further ruin. So he decided to invade Egypt. We don't have any depiction of Kashta, but presumably he was not unlike the kings who succeeded him. Kashta's ambitions in Egypt were limited. He simply wanted to protect the religious center of Thebes, modern-day Luxor, in southern or upper Egypt. King Kashta was a force to be reckoned with. He owned the gold mines in Kush and controlled the River Nile and land routes for luxury goods like ebony and ivory from further south in Africa. At his base in Napata, between the third and fourth cataracts of the River Nile, around 450 kilometers north of the modern-day capital Khartoum, Kashta ruled over a flourishing community of Kushites. King Kashta's main place of worship was at the nearby temple of Jabal Barkal. From a distance, it's imposing, and as you get nearer, you can begin to make out the well-preserved remains of the temple. Kashta's army was renowned for the skill of its horsemanship and its archers, who would dip their arrowheads into poison to make them more deadly. Their speciality was to shoot their opponents in the eye. Kashta's army first took Thebes, the religious capital of Egypt. For the most part, the Kushites were welcomed by the locals there, grateful that their co-religionists were seeing off the heathen Libyans. With Thebes secured, Kashta could rest easy. Three years after he'd begun the campaign into Egypt, King Kashta died. He was buried in Al Kuru in his homeland of Kush. Kashta's body was mummified in the Egyptian fashion and placed in a highly decorated wooden coffin covered in gold foil with inlays of colored glass and lapis lazuli. His body was placed facing east in the direction of which the sun rose and the coffin was placed in a grave like this, above which a huge pyramid would have stood. As befits a dead king, Kashta would need a large number of grave goods for the afterlife. Pottery, personal ornaments and jewellery were buried with him beneath his pyramid. 